Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure this morning to introduce Vice Admiral Craig, uh, Craig Clapperton. As an officer with a diverse background across many warfighting communities, he's here today, here today to speak as the, commanding, the commander of Fleet Cyber Command, JFHQ Cyber Navy, Commander 10th Fleet, and pending Senate confirmation, Navy Space Command. Without further ado, Admiral Clapperton. All right, Fred, thanks a lot. All right, hey, uh, good morning, everybody. I appreciate uh, there being so many folks here. I, I, I slid out of the SecNav uh, discussion early, and for any of you who've uh, left that one, I, I'll just uh, forewarn you, just be ready to be disappointed. There are two people uh, that can follow and, and talk with the passion uh, that the SecNav does. But I appreciate uh, everyone being here this morning, giving me the opportunity to tell you what the 20,000 sailors, uh, soldiers, Marines, airmen, and civilians of Fleet Cyber Command do. Uh, how they contribute to the war fight, uh, and then also talk to you a little bit about what we're doing, uh, and, and, and you'll see when I, when I talk about those things, how clearly it is that it's, it's critical that we have your support, that we're aligned between the military and, and industry to try to achieve the goals that we need to do uh, as we move forward. You know, the topics uh, and the theme for the conference this year, readiness, capability, and capacity, and I'm certainly going to cover uh, those areas as we move through the discussion this morning. Uh, you'll hear me talk a lot about readiness, uh, a lot about the capabilities we need, um, and to try to, again, to try to get after those things, to manage that talent pool, uh, and to work with you uh, as we build the capabilities that we need to go against the threat that we face today. Okay, uh, so uh, as Fred indicated, so I'm the commander of Fleet Cyber Command. Uh, the subordinate commander of Fleet Cyber Command is the Na U.S. Navy 10th Fleet. I'm also the commander of Joint Force Headquarters Cyber Navy. And then uh, recently stood up, and I'm still pending my confirmation from the Senate, to be the commander of Navy Space. Uh, so four commands, a uh, fairly diverse and wide set of uh, responsibilities and capabilities that we bring to the warfight. But because of those unique authorities, those unique capabilities, uh, the expertise that my team brings, uh, I think we, we enable the Joint Force uh, a real opportunity to integrate space, cyber, uh, information warfare, electronic warfare, and, and then again with my background uh, and, and the background of several of the, the unrestricted line officers that work with our expert IP cryptologic officers and intelligence officers in this field and, and our expert civilians is to really take those non-kinetic capabilities of space, cyber, and EW, and integrate it into the dynamic force maneuver, and integrate it into that kinetic warfight plan that Admiral Aquilino and Admiral Paparo have out in the Indo-PACOM theater. And I'll, t I'll explain specifically why I'm calling that out here uh, in just a second. Okay, so uh, as the Fleet Cyber Commander, I work directly for the CNO under ADCON, but I'm also then co-commed over to General Nakasone as the commander of US Cyber Command. Uh, so I'm the Navy component, uh, to U.S. Cyber Command or the Server si Service Cyber Component Commander, uh, and that's where I get a lot of my uh, SIGIN authorities as well as my uh, defensive cyber authorities. I'm also Combatant Command COCOM over to General Nakasone as the Commander of Joint Force Headquarters Cyber Navy, and that's where there's, again, additional Title 10 and Title 50 authorities as well as our offensive cyber authorities come through that path. And then, again, with the... With the uh, the, the formal announcement of Navy Space, COCOM to General Dickinson uh, as the Navy Space component. And again, we bring very unique capabilities um, as a service component to Space Command, uh, and then I think really provide a unique opportunity for us to integrate both our space and cyber capabilities. So those are the three four stars that I directly work for, but the 20,000 folks of Fleet Cyber Command also support six additional four stars across the globe. So first, globally, it's all the Navy fleet commanders. So Admiral Cottle, Admiral Paparo, Admiral Munch, and then my, my, my three-star fleet component uh, brothers, in, in, uh, Admiral Aiken and Admiral Cooper in fourth and fifth fleet. So we provide that global uh, defensive cyber, uh, information warfare, IP capability, assured C2 to, to the Navy globally. And then, under my fleet cyber and my joint force headquarters cyber navy component, I'm labeled as the regional cyber coordinator for the Indo-PACOM theater and the Southern and U.S. Southern Command. So that means I provide that that direct support to Admiral Aquilino, 
General La Camera in U.S. Forces Korea and General Richardson down in Southcom. So if they have questions about cyber, they come to me. And they say, and now there's a, a wide web of my partners across the, the joint force, uh, across working with NSA uh, and, and sometimes CISA that I will go to to try to solve those problems. But so that Admiral Aquilino, General Cameron, General Richardson don't have to have a, a Captain Crunch decoder ring to figure out who they need to go talk to in that, that place. Cyber Command has basically come up with this concept of regional cyber coordinators, and they just come to me. And they say, Clapperton, here's my problems. Here's my requirements. This is what I need. And then it's my job, uh, and, and, my, and again, that, that very diverse, talented group of 20,000 folks, it is our job to then reach out to the joint force and across the interagency and try to get those combatant commanders the capabilities, the war fighting requirements that they need. Okay, so that's kind of who we work for. So what do we bring to the fight? And that, that's what you see here on the slide, right? So these are the, the war fighting capabilities and, and competencies that my team brings to the joint fight. And I'll talk about each of them in, in detail as we go through. But first, you know, assured C2 and NC3, okay? You, you, cannot, you can't fight if you can't command and control, if you can't talk, if you don't have the data links, if you don't have the picture. So this isn't just a supporting capability. This is a no kidding war fighting capability. And I don't probably have to make that argument too vociferously uh, to this crowd. The next capability we bring that we'll talk more in detail about is battle space and space domain awareness. And that enables not only the domain awareness, the, un the understanding, the sensing, and the ability to, to comprehend what's going on in the various domains that you're fighting in, but then if and when necessary, deliver lethal long-range precision fires. You can't do that unless you have the picture. You can't do that unless you can bring together multi-int. A lot of it is SIGINT, quite honestly. Somewhere north of 75 to 80% of it right now is a SIGINT picture. So again, Fleet Cyber and our SIGINT authorities working closely with NSA are critical to that effort. And so providing that space and battle space awareness to the, globally to the Navy and then specifically to those commanders in Southcom and the Indo-PACOM region to make sure that they can command and control the fight and then if necessary, defeat our adversaries with, with great precision. And then finally, space and cyber effects, right? So everyone goes, oh, well, it's fleet cyber, it's JFHQ Navy cyber. So they tend to think of they're doing offensive and defensive cyber. So yes, we absolutely do those things. Um, but it, it is only a piece of what we do. And, and, it's, and it's more important than just the offensive and defensive cyber. It's that ability to coordinate it with space capabilities, with electronic warfare capabilities, with information capabilities, and then working closely with the other numbered fleets, closely with the, the Navy fleet commanders globally, and then with the commanders in the Indo-PACOM theater, integrating and synchronizing those space, cyber, and information effects to facilitate their ultimate goals with dynamic force maneuver or kinetic, or kinetic effects when necessary. So those are the kind of the big topics uh, that I want to cover and, and walk through today. I'll try to talk for uh, maybe another 15 or 20 minutes here, and then uh, hopefully have some, some time for some good questions. And then if we have a little bit of time at the end, I'm, I'd also like to talk to you a little bit about readiness and uh, some of the talent management issues and challenges that we have um, at Fleet Cyber. So let's start uh, with Assured C2. So when I talk about Assured C2, right, I'm talking about making sure that that, that group of leaders that, that we need to provide command and control capability and NC3 capability too, that they have a resilient, a redundant architecture, that it's there when they need it, we know that pieces of it will be denied. We know that already in the, in the, in the current situation we have right now, that some pieces of it are uh, more fragile than others, that some, of, some pieces of it are antiquated. Uh, so it is our job to improve those weaknesses, uh, but to create a resilient and redundant architecture that they can, get, that they can enable information to flow globally into the commanders that needs to happen. Now I'll also tell you, a large part of this is the defense effort, okay? And, and when I talk about defensive cyber, I'm not just talking about cyber security and cyber hygiene processes, right? I'm talking about defending our networks from advanced adversaries that are challenging and looking to penetrate and compromise those networks every day. And, and quite honestly, uh, I think the Navy is, is, is leading uh, in DOD in this, but regardless, we DOD, I would, I would state, if, 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 if I could be so bold, that you industry, we need to up our game in this space. Okay, we can't sit back and allow episodic 
deep dives with loud equipment and sensors to go out, look for adversaries, come back and say, oh, we didn't find anybody. And then think to yourself, things are great. I couldn't find any adversary. I saw no malicious activity. Everything must be wonderful. That, that is old think, okay? And I would tell you that in today's world, we need to move much more towards persistent monitoring, right? Of not just our endpoints, but of our data flow. Not just our endpoints in our data flow, but of our identity systems. And until we can get to a persistent monitoring situation that enables us to continually know what's going on across our networks, not just at the endpoints, but in the net flow, have AI and ML systems looking at what's happening every microsecond across those networks, and then triggering and telling operators when they need to take action, or to have the appropriate analytic that those systems are ready to step out and do the right thing when they need to, until we get to that point across all of our networks, we're at risk. I think right now the Navy is in pretty good shape at impact layer two, or the unclassed network, um, but we have work to do, and I, I look for help from industry as to how we can get those kind of products into our classified system, so IL-5 and IL-6, and then also into our afloat platforms, right? So the Navy's unique, and that we need those capabilities, not just ashore and in our enterprise systems, but we've got to have them on our afloat ships. And now that presents unique challenges, right? Because every one of those ships, the networks on them are unique. And you can't just take a simple solution that you might be able to take across the NMCI network and then apply it to 200 plus ships because they all look different. So I realize that that presents challenges. And again, I think this is a really important area where industry and the government and the Navy need to work together to solve that problem. Because again, we need that persistent monitoring and those immediate remediation and agile response mechanisms, not just in our floats or our ashore systems, but also on our ships. Really critical to do that if we're going to maintain the fight. Okay, moving on to battle space and maritime space domain awareness. All right, so around the globe, I have numerous task forces uh, across the United States on both coasts, in Hawaii, uh, in Guam, in Yokosuka, in Bahrain, in Italy. Uh, the, the, they are SIGINT collection centers, right, NIOX, Navy Information Operations Center. And their primary role is to sense and understand the battle space. They reach out to any number of ships, airplanes, submarines, tactical level sensors, national level sensors, and they fuse a picture from the SIGINT and comment side, and then they present that to the Navy globally, to US Indo-PACOM, US Forces Korea, and US Southcom, so that they have a picture to enable them to understand their battle space. So, you know, simple things like knowing if a PRC balloon is where it's supposed to be or not. My guys play a piece of that, okay? Understanding where adversary ships, submarines, airplanes are. Helping our partners to understand where those adversary and aggressor ships, submarines, surface to air missiles, tanks, command and control centers might be. So understanding that battle space is absolutely critical. You cannot be the commander of a battle space. You cannot even begin to fight and protect and hold battle space if you don't understand it and you can't sense it correctly. What we need to also continue to move towards, though, is the ability to enable that long-range precision fire and that, the feed to that data layer that needs to exist across the entire domain, from the tactical edge all the way to the national enterprise level. So right now, we're pretty good if, if space and cables and cyber and all the EW systems are up and functioning. Can we push a really complicated, very clear, cohesive picture forward? Yes, we can. When that starts to get denied or challenged, or some places where we have single points of failure or fragility and acts of God or acts of nature or acts of stuff just being old take over, we can get challenged fairly quickly. So we need to move to an environment, right, where this, this ability to understand your battle space is in sort of a data layer, right? And so I just, you know, if you imagine this is the tactical edge and this is the enterprise level, right, there's this just massive data layer up there. And everybody from, you know, ADF Colorado, National Capital Region, the commands out in Hawaii, a ship, an airplane, or submarine on the tactical edge, a regional headquarters in Guam or on the Philippines or wherever it might be, they can reach up to that data layer, pull down the information they need, 
and execute their mission. Equally important is for their ability to contribute to that data layer, right? Because you can't just rely on national technical means to understand the battle space. You need ships, submarines, aircraft, soldiers, sailors, marines that are running around in different countries, working with partners, or in when, when, when necessary on adversary terrain. They need to be able to contribute to that picture. And the better information they can contribute to that picture, so in other words, enabling that PED at the tactical edge to the extent that they can, critical. We need industry's help in trying to build and improve where we are there. And then we need to enable that tactical edge communication to contribute in a compliant and standardized way up to this data layer. And then when necessary, they can pull down from the enterprise layer or the regional layer or the strategic layer or whatever level it is from the National Command Authority all the way to the the corporal on the forward battlefield, that they can pull down and access that level and contribute to that data layer so that they understand the picture and they can help enable the fight. There's lots of initiatives going on in this area, right? People hear about Project Convergence, Project Overmatch, uh, a maritime targeting cell. Uh, there, there are, you know, there's countless systems and efforts going on. So we need everybody's help to, one, make sure that those systems are working together in synchronicity, right? It's no good if the Army system enables the Army, but it doesn't contribute to anybody else. And I'm not picking on the Army, I'm just using that as an example, right? Same thing's true with the Navy, the Marine Corps, whatever. Everybody's system needs to communicate with one another in a compliant and standardized way so that regardless of what part of the joint force wants to access that information, they can, and that it feeds all the way up. And when the system's working perfect, you have this amazing, single pane of glass that tells you the whole picture, but then even as the system starts to degrade and break down, which you know in a contested environment it will, that there's still an effective picture that enables those long-range precision fires to get after the fight. Okay, uh, moving on to my final uh, war fighting capability and then hopefully just a, a quick touch on readiness and talent management. So space and cyber effects. Um, so it, when we think about the, cy the cyber effects of today, right, um, so a lot of it, first of all, is defensive. The better I can defend my networks, the better I can defend my weapon systems, the harder it is for an adversary to penetrate those or degrade those. That is a deterrent effect. Make no mistake about it, adversaries try to do that every day. As they try to do that, and they realize how on point we are and how advanced we are, that deters them from thinking this is the day to go challenge the United States, to challenge their partners and allies. That is a significant deterrent effect. That's part of what reinforces to them that we are that 10 foot, 10 foot tall giant. Try to get through, try to get to our weapon systems, try to get to our networks, run into very talented, very comprehensive, very agile defensive systems. And those systems need to continue to improve to that persistent monitoring and agile response that I talked about and we're moving in that direction, and we need to continue to accelerate and move in that direction. Offensively, we need to be more agile as well. We need to be able to get through interagency coordination faster, and we need to posture ourselves that if and when necessary, we can degrade adversary networks and weapon systems to enable the dynamic force maneuver and the kinetic and traditional forces to operate inside weapons engagement zones and deliver the effects that are necessary. Can't talk about a lot of those details here, but what I would tell you is no cyber effect on its own is enough, right? And this, I mentioned this before, it must be synchronized and aligned with space effects. It must be synchronized and aligned with EW effects, information effects. Then you layer that on top of emissions control and deception and dynamic force maneuvering and decoys. And you create an incredibly complicated environment where we own the electromagnetic spectrum, where we are degrading the adversary's picture while ma maintaining ours. The non-kinetics are integrated with the kinetics, and that's how you win fights in the modern world. So we're working very closely. I think Fleet Cyber, JFHQ, Navy, 10th Fleet, Navy Space is really uniquely postured. There aren't, every service kind of breaks down those authorities and capabilities in a different way, but I think we are somewhat uniquely postured and how we have those capabilities and how we can work together with combatant commanders and, and, and certainly in the Indo-PACOM theater as the regional cyber coordinator to integrate those non-kinetics into the war fight and make them a more lethal force. And we work hard at that every day. 
It's another area where I think certainly working with industry uh, on, on developing the capabilities, developing new technologies, developing new access measures, uh, and new methods to maneuver uh, is going to be a really critical effort. If I could, just, just one or two minutes here on readiness and talent management. So uh, as, as has been said numerous times this week by, by lots of folks, uh, we're all kind of fishing from the same pond, industry, government, military. Um, and in some cases, and in some of those skill sets, the pond's pretty shallow. Uh, but we do need to work together to get after that problem, uh, you know, find new and unique ways for, the, for folks that are in the military to gain the insights of what's going on in industry. So co-op programs, and, and, the, and we have s some of those, uh, but taking greater advantage of those is important. Uh, for those of you that have reserve officers uh, and enlisted uh, men and women that work for you, uh, you know, giving them and, be, and being open with them with the opportunity for them to come back into the Navy and share uh, the immense experience and expertise that they gain uh, from their time with you in, in the uh, research and development facilities and in industry and education and bring that back in and make sure we have the latest and greatest on what's going on there. I would also say uh, that we, we need to, you know, in, in this, and I think this is part of talent management, is share information better uh, with one another, right? So we, we need to tell you uh, in, in very clear and uncertain terms where we see adversary threat and when we think you are at threat and what we would do uh, if we were in your circumstances and we need to build the trust between us so that you understand that we're not trying to tell you, you know, how we can play big brother in your networks. That is not our game at all. But, but the, def the defense industrial base, defense critical infrastructure, and really U.S. critical infrastructure at large is absolutely necessary to what we do in the military. And if our networks are protected but yours aren't, we fail. If our systems depend on civilian power, water, cooling, which in many cases they do, and those systems aren't protected, we fail. So working better together in that information exchange and that exchange of talent and understanding uh, I think is a really critical piece. And then just the last 60 seconds here, and then I, I really look forward to questions. So if you have hard ones, I've got some of my experts from uh, NCDOC, Navy Cyber Operations, uh, Navy Cyber Defensive Operations Center, here in the crowd, they'll take all your really hard questions. I'll take the easy ones. Uh, I know Captain Braswell. Where are you, Braswell? I saw him in the back. He's getting up. He's getting up here next. So if your questions just start to get really hard, I'm just going to introduce Braz and bring him up here. Uh, but but we'll get to those. But but uh, j just a second on on readiness in, in the new NDA language. I'm sure many of you have seen uh, that Congress has come out with language in the NDA telling the Navy to create a cyber designator and a cyber rating. So I, I, I ultimately I think this is a good thing. Uh, I have been advocating uh, since my time in Cybercom when I became a flag officer that we need experts. Um, I don't need generalists. Um, and this is experts in cyber, experts in SIGINT, experts in information management. If, to go after the adversaries that we face today, to defeat the threats that we face today, to protect our networks in the way that you're challenged today, I need experts in each of those areas. And so with this new NDA language that tells us that we have to have a cyber officer and a cyber enlisted rating, that's clearly going to create the expertise that I want as long as we execute it properly. And I'm working really closely with my partner, Admiral uh, Kelly Oshbach, who many of you have had the opportunity to hear speak today. Great partner. We're, we're very, very aligned in this effort to create an expertise uh, and, and develop real experts that, are, that know the mission set and know the adversary extremely well in cyber. And I think that'll have second and third order effects to the other areas of cryptology and information management. As, as the cryptologists and those ratings specialize in cyber, that means the folks that were doing cyber, SIGIN, and EMW, well, guess what? Now it's just SIGIN and EMW. And I think as we mature that further, you're going to see them really sort of silo out. Now, I see that as a good thing because, again, we need experts, uh, not generalists. So I, I, I am encouraged by this. Uh, there's a ton of work to do going forward, but I, I see it really as an opportunity uh, to really drive and create those experts that we need uh, and really try to manage the talent as we get after these three warfighting capabilities uh, for the nine four-star commands that the men and women of Fleet Cyber Command support. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, sir. I think most of us can respect that. Um, I'm assuming you're going to get that approval on the Space Force. I know you will. We're not so, allowed to assume, sir. Amen. <laughs> but let's just, this, here's, because again, I could ask a million questions, so I'll, I'll center on that one. 
as you work with the joint commanders, the COCOMs you said, and the different fleet commanders, and you work with Air Force Blue on Space Force, here's the question. There's clearly going to be some maritime missions that will be important from a cyber 10th fleet, your hats. How will that be resourced as you work with Air Force Blue Space Force to ensure that those kind of missions are either insured, protected, and I know you're going to work with other, other naval leaders. You talked about Kelly already, OPNAV. Can you get, shed a little more light on that so that we can help you with those kind of yeah. maritime specific tool sets you may need? Absolutely. So, so I, first I'll tell you that's still very much in work, right? So the space, space comms, space force are still relatively new and Navy space is you know, a month and a half old. So, so, so not all of those things are formulated, but I will tell you what, where I'm thinking and what I've talked to people about is um, I really need uh, what, I, what I like to call, and, and they, they've used this term before, and so it's not the same as what other, I, I call them non-kinetic effects teams, right? And, I, and so that means not only the teams that are going to be um, p potentially in my mocks, potentially at the tactical edge, um, but also the planners that are in my headquarters and that would move forward to Indo-PACOM, PAC Fleet, U.S. Forces Korea, wherever they need to. And this is a team of experts that, would, that, that I'm building at Fleet Cyber now that have space expertise and really understand that game and how that works and have cyber expertise. Uh, and I'm going to need to plus up the number of, I've, I've, uh, I've already talked to CNO about this, so I'm clear to, to say it. He's not going to kill me for this. Uh, but I've already talked to him and said, hey, look, the number of folks that we have lined out and envisioned for Navy space, that, that number is going to grow a lot. Because if I'm going to have the right planners at my headquarters to figure this out, and then I'm going to be able to push those teams forward to you know, a FIWIC pack, an Indo-PACOM, a US Forces Korea to help, because they're not going to have that expertise. I'm going to need to sort of parachute in with that group of folks. And what I sort of envision is the perfect scenario is it's rotational, right? I have a group back at my headquarters that are getting refreshed and got up to all the latest and greatest. And then I have groups forward that are helping to integrate this on a daily basis with those combatant commanders, right? And so that's at the planning and the operational level. And then uh, we can't just sit and have in our heads anymore, oh, well, I'm going to have an interactive operator and they're going to do that cyber thing to the bad guys when they need to, right? Yeah, that interoper interactive operator needs to be there, but we're going to need to have teams, non-kinetic teams, that know how to do things on net, know how to do things off net, how to do things in the RF spectrum, how to do things you know, in the space spectrum, EW, and bring all those capabilities to bear together in a synchronized fashion. You, you know, if, if you're relying on a specific access path to deliver an effect, but the EW effect or the space effect takes that path out, oops, right? We don't, look, the, the bad guys don't need help, right? We can't fratricide our own efforts. So it's really important um, that we, those teams forward uh, understand the game as well and, and, it, and that they operate in a, a synchronized fashion. So that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. That's what we're trying to work for. Yes, it's going to mean uh, more resourcing. Um, yes, it's going to need uh, and mean new kit and new capability and new tools to do those things the right way. And I, I'm hoping to you know, have a great partnership with industry as we move forward. Appreciate that question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm Paul Rospel from Systems Planning and Analysis. I'll ask you the, the same question I've asked several of your colleagues here, which is, uh, as you go about doing this business, a lot of it highly classified, uh, how do you work with allies and partners, and what are the challenges there? Okay, yeah, it's a great question. And, and there are, you know, there are too many allies and partners that we work with in this space to list. I mean, uh, you know, certainly our 5i partners uh, are amazing, uh, and we work really closely with them, and we can certainly share uh, the most with them, uh, and we do. Um, but we're not without challenge there. I mean, this, as the second I've mentioned, uh, you, you may be aware that this organization has a, uh, just a bit of red tape in it once in a while. Uh, and so we need to get more agile and better at, at sharing information, not just with all of our allies and partners, but even with our 5i folks, right? Um, I would tell you, um, Clapperton's opinion, um, they're actually more agile often than we are in sharing back with us. And there's a bit more bureaucracy, I feel like, sometimes on our side to share with them. Um, I've shared that with uh, numerous of our 5i partners that I try to, am trying to get information to. We eventually get there, um, but we've got to get faster at that. Um, but Five Eyes isn't enough, right? There, there. I, I won't even begin to list all the various allies and partners that, that we need to coordinate with on, on, a, on a daily basis. Um, and and so, yeah, we need to figure out the right level of classification and information we can share. That that, and then ultimately, when they get that information, they have to trust what we're telling us, right? They, so that's a really critical piece of it. So yes, more agile, more effective, more secure in how we communicate with them. 
But ultimately, it's really about building the trust with them because th with many of these folks, we're never going to be able to give them the full picture, right? That quote unquote, no foreign picture, right? The most exquisite stuff. We're just not going to share that. It's not realistic. So there has to be that foundation of trust that, hey, when I tell you that's where the bad guys are or that's what the bad guys are doing, right? That they believe us and trust us and they're willing to act on that. Otherwise, you don't, you're not agile enough uh, to respond, right? And in some cases, this is going to require uh, the U.S. and 5 I countries to use some of our more advanced capabilities and share those with our partners and potentially even have a situation where it's managed on both ends, right? And, and, and then we, we provide that stuff directly to them to sort of facilitate and make that communication more agile. But you're 100% you're right. Um, facing the adversaries that we do today, uh, certainly this has you know, been very evident in the Russia-Ukraine scenario. It has to be uh, an alliance, a partnership, a, an international effort to have those effects, and clearly not just in the military world, across the dime. So absolutely. Yes, sir, you were next. To what, to the extent you can, what, uh, can you describe the non-kinetic capabilities under your pur purview and how th those uh, might enable long-range precision fires, not just for the Navy, but the broader joint force? Yeah, so certainly uh, an area where I can uh, rocket past the, uh, the classification level of this room very quickly. Um, so th th I think I'll, I'll just leave it at this, right? They are space effects. They are cyber effects. They are electronic warfare effects. They are effects that happen on net. They are effects that happen off net. And they are effects to, to weaken the adversary's ability to do those things that I'm talking about, right? If, if, so these are the war fighting capabilities I bring to the fight. If I can make it so that the adversary's ability to use and employ and implement the same concepts, if I can degrade those, then we're winning. Um, and so, so when I, when the effects that I'm primarily talking about, it's to prevent the adversary from doing the things that I want to do, which that then in turn enables Admiral Aquilino, Admiral Paparo, General LaCamera, uh, General Richardson to, to execute their mission more effectively and more safely. So it just to, to quickly clarify, so it's not necessarily enabling uh, friendly forces uh, to, to do better targeting on long-range precision fires. You're talking more on a denial uh, perspective? No, no, it's absolutely both of those things. So it's, it's both of those things, right? That, uh, so if I, if I gave you the impression that it's one or the other, absolutely not, it's both. I need to give them that battle space domain awareness, that ability to long-range precision fire. In some cases, that, that may be the most important thing. Their ability to deliver a lethal effect that could be incredibly important, right? But at the same time, my ability to prevent the adversary from doing those things and then targeting our forces and enabling them greater freedom of movement, that could potentially be the most important. So it, it depends very much on the situation. Um, and the answer to that question is yes. I, I want to do both, and I want to do both as effectively as I can. Ma'am, I believe you are next. Lauren Williams with Defense One. Thank you for taking my question. I wanted to ask you about 10th Fleet's Cyber Dragon program. They're taking reservists and using them to kind of fill some of those talent needs that you were talking about. I'm interested if that's something you're tracking, if it's meeting your expectations, would you like to see it expanded, that sort of thing? So 100% so I'm tracking it. In fact, I have a, um, an extremely talented uh, reserve flag officer on my staff, Admiral Steve, Do Steve Donald. He, he is a, a national treasure, and we need more like him. So again, advocate, uh, for, advocate for you guys if you have senior uh, reserve officers uh, on your teams, uh, allowing them to come active duty, incredibly important. So Steve runs that program for me. Um, we, we, we track it very carefully. I, uh, we, 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 we wish it was bigger, candidly, right? So, so yes, there is, there's some really good niche talent, some really good experience that we're able to bring in. And when we take those, um, those reservists and put them on to, to mission and, and uh, take their uh, expertise and the latest and greatest that they may have had from the civilian side, bring it to our, uh, our forces and the active duty side, and we employ them together, we get great effect from that. Um, but... Uh, but that number's in the hundreds for the Navy. I, I, I don't know the exact number. I think it's about only 300 folks uh, that are totally in, uh, that, that are cyber experts on the reserve side of the Navy. And that number needs to be much higher. Uh, so I would love to see uh, that number increase. And Steve and I are working really hard uh, with Chief of Naval Reserves to figure out ways uh, to better use our reserve force to make us more effective. Are you tapping Congress at all to get more support in that area? 
I, I, I'm sorry. Are you asking Congress for support? Well, so, so I certainly would advocate it. That would really be Chief of Naval Reserves uh, to, to make that ask. I certainly advocate uh, Tavern Boston all the time, and, and I will continue to do so. Uh, other questions? In the back, yes, ma'am. What is one of the biggest untested assumptions that you view um, in Navy cyberspace, whether it be about our own capabilities or our adversary and the threat that we're facing or um, private sector partners, anything like that? So that's a great question. Uh, you know, one of the really, really challenging things uh, in cyber and space uh, is to know whether it's going to work or not, right? Because when you're, start, when you're talking about exquisite capabilities, right, you certainly aren't going to use them until, oh my gosh, we really need them, right? And, and uh, other commanders always ask us, okay, how sure are you this is going to have the effect that it needs? How sure are you that you're going to be able to defend my pick your network um, when, when the adversary does, tries to penetrate it or take it away from me? Um, and so um, we work really closely with a number of uh, civilian and contracting companies to improve our ability in modeling and simulation here. Um, and be able to say, okay, if we were to do this offensive thing, if we were to do this defensive thing, if we were to do this electronic warfare thing, what would that happen? I mean, what would happen with the adversary when we did that? And so they've got to build, you know, a range to test that. They've got to build a network to do those tests and developments and assess the effectiveness. Um, and then with an understanding of that effectiveness, then how does that then mitigate risk to force, risk to mission uh, as we go forward? Um, we, we are starting to accelerate and get better in that area, but I will, again, this is another area where I think uh, the government, the military, the industry really need to work together and partner on to be able to do that because, you know, th there are a lot of things that we are quote unquote assuming. Now, there, we're not, we are no longer in the place where we're just assuming because we're pretty sure we're smart guys and this is gonna work. Um, we do have um, the ability to model and simulate some of it, but it's not as mature as I would like it to be, right? Where I would tell you, where, where it really needs to be matured is really in the integration and the layering of effects, right? You, told, you heard me talk about all the different things we need to layer together to make that joint force as lethal as possible. Um, creating modeling and simulation live virtual constructive environments that actually enable us to see against a real threat representational network whether or not those space and cyber effects are gonna have the intention that, that we say they are to help um, uh, the, the, the forward commanders assess their real risk to their force. Yeah, we, we gotta get better there, um, but it is accelerating. I like the direction it's going, just lots of work to do there, and I think it's a really important area for us to partner, so appreciate you asking that. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, good morning, sir. Albert Ando from Agile Defense. You mentioned uh, vulnerabilities to critical infrastructure, and I believe the same can be said in the Navy and across the DOD, particularly with OT systems. I was wondering what your thoughts are on OT, IT convergence, and if you have any idea on a way ahead or a timeline or a sense of urgency uh, to uh, kind of remediate some of those OT vulnerabilities. Thank you. The, 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 what, say the last part of the... And if you had any uh, a way ahead or thoughts on way ahead and sense of urgency regarding, uh, you know, implementing solutions to uh, mitigate those effects on OT systems. Yeah, I mean, so so do we need to get faster and more agile? Yeah, absolutely, we do. Um, I, I think um, I, I think candidly, uh, when, when we start talking about uh, effects on OT and systems in development, right? Um, we we need to be uh, we need to be very realistic with ourselves about what is cap what is possible and what is not possible, right? Sometimes we we sort of take uh, a vector or an avenue of threat, um, and we go this. This is how it's going to happen, right? And I think we get too narrowly scoped on that. And in some cases, uh, again, I'm trying to dance around the classification here, so you have to pardon me. Um, in some cases, some of those vectors of choice to really dive into and protect against, I'm like, okay, well, sure, that could happen. But the chances and the likelihood of that scenario are extremely remote, right? So I, I think um, we need to be careful to not get so boresighted on some of these, you know, very elaborate, exquisite, and candidly unlikely paths, and, and then open up the aperture to understand, hey, there, there's a lot of potential vectors and a lot of potential access points here, uh, and we need to look at this in a holistic manner, right? And, and, um, and then, but, but still moving forward uh, as we develop these systems. And I would also argue, and this is something that's going on now, is the sooner we, we bake in that cyber safe, right? Um, from from ac real access vectors uh, that we know are out there, um, then and we get that earlier on, 
uh, in the developmental process. Uh, it's, instead of waiting until the end and the weapon system, the airplane, whatever it is, is the, the missile is done, and then you go, oh, well, can it defend itself against a cyber attack or an EW attack? Oh, yeah, you know, maybe we should go check that out, right? And I'm being a little facetious there. Um, but again, if, you, if we start doing that at day one, and we start doing that with what, uh, what, what capabilities and vectors are truly, really likely instead of getting boresighted on some bizarre ones, um, I think we give ourselves a more holistic approach. Um, and again, moving it earlier in the cycle, that speeds the cycle along. Because I think what happens a lot now, in my opinion, is we get so far down the line and then somebody asks the question, and then, and then, and then, all, you know, then, then that's sort of when you get the good idea fairy. Oh, what about this vector? What about that vector? What about this vector? And there's no holistic look at, hey, did we really, can you defend against everything? Probably no, right? And so the, the idea is, hey, how do I make it as effective and safe as I can earlier on so that we don't get those stops and all these random good ideas later in the, in the process, which I think ultimately slows us down more. Does that, that answer your question, sir? Okay, I think I got time for maybe one more. Okay. In the back. Good morning, sir. I'm Anton Hernandez. I am the communications officer on board the Portland. Um, you mentioned earlier about afloat networks, and um, I'm going to take a little piece from the uh, SecDef speech earlier. So with our ever-growing Navy and um, these new ships that are coming online, by the time the ship is built, the contracts for the networks have already been implemented. And then by the time the ship is actually built, it's behind in the rest of the fleet in that network. Um, for example, I um, outfitted a ship 10 years ago with canes, and I am now on a ship getting newly outfitted with canes right now. So that's a, about a decade time frame in there. Is there a plan to have our fleet updated at a faster rate than what it's being updated now. And then with our future fleet that we also have, is there also a plan to also upgrade our older ships to kind of be on the same platform at the same time when we come up with these new networks? Okay, a lot to unpack there. Uh, so first, uh, thank you for what you do and th thanks for your service. Um, so, so uh, okay, so um, <clears throat> is there a better way uh, as we, you know, because I think you're spot on, right? That, you know, we, we have system, operating system X, right? And we start developing the ship, and the ship takes five years. And by the time uh, we get to put that ship in the water and actually execute it, the system X is you know seven steps behind where we are today, right? Um, and so I actually was talking to, uh, with the nav war engineers about this exactly uh, yesterday. Uh, and and what I, I think we need to find some kind of a format that basically says, okay, the 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 operating system, the network that's going to be on that platform, right? It needs to be at least this but then somehow put wording and language in there. But as operating system X matures, right, uh, and becomes the next version and the next version and the next version, we need to basically say, hey, it's okay if you then, you know, as, as we move a year forward, that, that you go ahead and upgrade that system to that, that next step, right? Instead of saying, well, you know, Windows 95 is what we planned, and now here we are, you know, you're like, oh my gosh, that's not a great idea, right? Um, so so we, need to, we need to be able to be more agile in that, right? But then to do that, right, to do that, we need to make sure that the networks we're designing on a float platforms, uh, to up, to, when we go to upgrade them, isn't going to take a six-month or a 12-month availability to be able to go through and rip out all this other legacy, antiquated stuff and put new stuff in, right? So we've got to be, and this is, again, another great area for partnership between the Navy and, and industry is we've got to design networks, right, that can be upgraded similarly to the way our enterprise networks ashore do, right? We, when we push out, you know, Windows 10 and, and the latest upgrades uh, for flank speed for the Navy, right? And, and I mean, look, I mean, I get it. Everybody, you know, and all the commands around the Navy is like, oh, God, Fleet Cyber is going to push out Windows 10. Oh, God. And, and there's drama, Right, but there's drama for like two or three days or a couple of weeks until we get all everybody on the same line. And then we, we literally get thousands and thousands and thousands of endpoints and dozens and dozens of networks across the country updated in a matter of weeks, right? But we try to do one ship and one network with a few hundred endpoints, it's a 12 month process, right? We gotta get out of that business and we've gotta start more intelligently designing the networks of these ships so that when Windows 10, 11, 12, 15 or whatever it is comes along, Right, that we just send that update to the ship, and it's there, and it operates, and it's not going to crash the entire system, uh, and then we're, you know, we're not going to end up, you know, gosh, we still, there's still ships out there, uh, and MS, uh, and the MSC fleet with ISNS Compose, right? We, we have got to be more agile in that, and I think to do that, it requires smarter and better design and implementation of the networks, but then a different contracting and acquisition process 
that enables uh, the, the AITs and the, and the contractors and the team that's building the ship, that if the next great thing comes along, that they're cleared to put that in, right? The accept, hey, the, we, we get it, this is good, the next thing's probably gonna be better, put that in there, right? So we gotta be more agile there. Okay, uh, I, I'd love to talk with you guys about this uh, all day, literally, uh, and I can take all of Braz's time, um, but I, I, I can't do that. Uh, I know he's uh, itching to get up here, but again, I want to I wanna thank uh, the West team for the opportunity to do this uh, and, and speak to you today. I want to thank all of you for your patience and interest uh, to hear about, again, with a really, really talented group of 20,000 men and women do across the fleet cyber enterprise and the important uh, capabilities and war fighting that they bring to the joint force. So thank you guys all very much. Appreciate it.